welcome to another fantastic episode of Adventures in DevOps. I am your uh, host or co-host, uh, as always, Nell Shamrell Harrington. And with me are my two co-hosts today, uh, Scott and Chuck. Scott, how are you doing? I'm doing great today. How are you? It's uh, another nice, cool uh, day here in uh, Bend, Oregon. So, Yep, it's cool and damp uh, here in Seattle, Washington. And, and here's just downright freaking cold. <laughs> I was about to ask you how it is, Chuck, but it sounds like cold is the answer. I, I think it got over freezing a little bit today, but the last two or three days, it didn't even break 30 degrees. So it's cold. Yeah. It sounds like it. Hey, folks, this is Charles Maxwood, and I just launched my book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. It's up on Amazon. We self-published it. I would love your support. If you want to go check it out, you can find it there, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. Have a good one. Max out. Well, also with us today is our very special guest. I uh, guess I'm going to see if I say this right. Or Weiss, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes, that's exactly correct. Oh, excellent. Uh, or it's fantastic to have you. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, so my name is uh, Or Weiss, as you've mentioned. Sometimes I like to introduce myself with other people. So I'd go something like, uh, please meet Daniel and Or. And people go, and or what? Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm uh, uh, the CEO and one of the co-founders of a cool startup called Rookout. I've been a developer from a very young age, basically from the age of five. I uh, worked in the intelligence community in the IDF. Uh, I was a VP of R&D, and as I said, now I'm leading Rookout, which uh, enables developers to get amazing workflows and get data with ease out of their live software uh, with just a click. And uh, you mentioned your uh, localities. I'm uh, currently in Tel Aviv, which is extremely warm, so I'm probably getting the better weather right now and uh, inviting you guys also to enjoy the weather here. <laughs> I'm there tomorrow. <laughs> definitely, definitely on my list of places to go for sure. Yeah, so. no kidding. So when you're here, pop crawl uh, on me. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Sweet. Oh, man. Yeah. So I, uh, I know, you know, we're going to talk a lot about, about logging and debugging and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I'm curious, can you tell me a little bit about your background and why you're uniquely, you know, the guy that solved this problem? Yeah, sure. So I already kind of mentioned my uh, background in the intelligence core um, in the IDF. Uh, so most of my career I worked in cybersecurity, uh, but mostly as a developer. So I got a taste of both developer life, but also access to the low-level mechanics of software. And I've experienced two things. One, uh, the dramatic change and transformation the software went through. Um, when At the beginning of my career, when I was working, uh, when I was building a server, it was just a single physical box in front of me, and that's what I ended up delivering to a customer. But without noticing, we moved from that single physical box to the uh, to the server from and to the cloud and into virtual machines and containers and Kubernetes and serverless. And I noticed that it all became so completely complex in such a short period of time. And I started to feel the pain of how hard it is just to connect your own software. Essentially today, we don't even know where the hell our code's running. And when we want to connect to it or trying to understand it, we end up going through very complex flows today. Um, and then my other uh, side came into the picture and said, this is our software. These are our servers. It's not someone else's. Why do I have to spend so much time redeploying and writing code to connect to it and see what it does? Why can't it just tell me what it's doing? Why can't I just click on a line and see the values of variables or uh, what's the current code flow? And so my co-founder and I leveraged our uh, access to the low level components, what we've learned in cybersecurity, and enable that experience exactly with what we're offering at Rookout. You can go to your code at any point in time, click on any line and get any variable, any log line, no matter where, it, where it's running. It could be running on your local machine, it can be running on Kubernetes, it can be running on AWS Lambda or serverless elsewhere, and you'll instantly get any piece of data. Um, and so we, 
kind of both the pain that I've experienced as a developer and the unique skills that I've gathered uh, uh, throughout my career kind of uh, uh, came into a, a pinnacle point here that enabled the, what we were building today. Sorry, I'm still crying inside over the good old days when it was just one server and I could just SSH <laughs> in and have a look. Exactly. <laughs> I'm remembering when it increased to four servers and I would have a TMUX terminal with a separate uh, yeah. shell for <laughs> each of those four servers. And then I would click and uh, just watch and see, try to catch which one it showed up on. Uh, so cent centralized logging was a revelation. Yeah. Telnet or not Telnet, <laughs> tail minus F. Yes, Hype exactly. Rep. Yeah. Uh, not anymore. So something <laughs> you... We really have the uh, lobster treatment in this in the past kind of decade. So we, we didn't really notice all these chains happening. So initially, we just, okay, so I'll just add another terminal. And then, okay, I'll just add another set of commands to go into the container. And now, okay, I'll add another layer on top of uh, Kubernetes to get the data. And every time, it's one more thing, one more thing. And before you notice, you're running very complex infrastructure just to do things that used to be very simple. Yeah, I was going to say the the good old days, it also wasn't just, oh, there are four servers, but is this a problem on the uh, load balancer? Is this a problem in the the caching on the load balancer? You know, is, is it a problem in, with the database layer? And then, yeah, like you said, you know, we've added all this stuff in. So now is it is it a problem with my my server infrastructure provider? Is it a problem with Kubernetes? DNS? Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh, ouch. <laughs> but yeah, right. And so, yeah, like you said, you know, it's just one more thing and it solves a problem. And my life got easier until something broke. And then it got more complicated. We've been oh. essentially, we focused on the software itself. We were like, okay, we have to build these amazing things. And we were able to achieve that. We really, software today, if you look, uh, on older servers today, like the legacy stuff to survive, it's like, it's horrendous. But we kind of left the developers behind. We're kind of like, okay, let's focus on the software, but we forgot to enable ourselves to run at the same pace alongside it. That's, that's I, my feeling on it. I just saw a tweet uh, earlier today, actually, mentioning how we did, we brought, or Kubernetes was created, it's done fantastic things for operators, but it feels like it's left developers out. Mm -hmm. uh, with I, the amount of complexity that it's added. Right. Yeah, that, that is really, really actually, because I talk primarily to programmers, right? Not to operators. And that, that, is a, that is really a feeling that people have in the development community. They feel like this stuff is just way out there and hard to really understand. I mean, even down to Docker, which once you start playing with it, it's kind of like, oh, I kind of get what's going on here. But just looking from the outside in, it looks so complicated. And then there are all these people saying all of these different things about it. And it turns out that, yeah, you've got to figure out what you need and how it applies. But yeah, you know, going beyond that is it's, it's tricky. And also all these things are happening in parallel and kind of adding complexity on, on top of each other. Just working with a container, that's something that you're able to do uh, and able to kind of wrap your mind around it. But now when you have Kubernetes and you have a load balancer, that kind of shifts the traffic around and creates more instances on the fly in a faster pace than you're even able to think. Uh, that's where things I feel at least become really complex. So you're, let's say you're able to connect to an instance, you SSH to it, or you get the log tailing out of a specific instance. By the time you complete that process, the load balancer might just shift the traffic into another instance or even Kubernetes would take the instance out of existence and spin out 10 more. So mm -hmm. it's really the pace in which we're working as humans and the pace at which the software is mutating, they're, they're not in sync. And I think that's a, a key part of the friction. Something that's frustrated me when something goes wrong with a Kubernetes cluster that I'm using is trying to figure out which microservice uh, the error occurred in. Uh, how would something like uh, Rook help with that? So we have an, a really cool feature called project filters. And we kind of turn the, the dime on its head when it comes to how you connect your software. Usually with classic debuggers or with uh, uh, other uh, uh, data collection tools, you connect to the software. 
uh, you try to open a port to it and you connect to specific targets and try to see what's happening. With Rookout, the way it works is you deploy an SDK as part of your software and you have your software connect back to you. So at the first place, it does the effort to uh, tell you what's going on. And then with that feature, with the uh, project filter, you're able to say, these are the things that I care about. I care about instances that have these values. I care about production environment. I care about the billing service. I care about uh, services that are servicing this specific user. And the breakpoints or the data collection points that are applied are focused on those areas. And as, and as the software mutates, the project filter keeps you in sync with those instances. So it doesn't matter what's happening. You don't need to chase after your software. Your software is now chasing after you, which is, I think, the way you want it to go. Like the machines should be serving the humans and not vice versa, at least for a couple more years. Yeah, that's what the, we hope. Yeah, until the time it arrives. <laughs> right. So I'm kind of curious, what, what are some unique challenges that you, and you know, around serverless that maybe around debugging as well and logging. I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So uh, those are a couple of different areas. Also, I'll start with, uh, with logging. Um, and I actually think that kind of highlights the pain because we're starting to see um, additional layers of, of pain and friction that are coming up uh, arising from the basic ones. One of the key pain points that we're seeing today, I think, with companies is something that I like to call logging FOMO. Because it has become so complex and so full of friction to get even a single log line, people are thinking, oh, when I want to get a log line, I'll have to write more code, I'll have to redeploy, I'll have to go through a complex process. So already in their mind, they're kind of hesitant, they're kind of worried. I have to be sure that I'll cover as many logs as I can in the first place. So the current mindset today is try and log everything. But that's kind of a horrible idea because it costs you in performance, it costs you in maintenance works, it costs in general friction in you maintaining your software. And you've got to store those logs somewhere when yeah. you're logging everything. Yep. Exactly. And you have to pay licensing costs for them, especially if you're working with solutions like Splunk. That's going to cost a pretty penny. And uh, you, and I think about actually, I think the worst part is just uh, the maintenance work around that clearing out the, the caches, clearing out the logs, maintaining the pipelines themselves. Now, companies are fun funneling gigabytes and terabytes of data. Uh, and most of it, the ironic part, most of it is garbage that no one's going to look at ever. And actually, it's making it worse because now when they're looking for the things that they care about, they need to sift through all that garbage. Um, so th I think that's one of the key challenges that, uh, that we're seeing. And we're, again, trying to turn the dime on its head. We're saying, Collect the data that you need when you need it and focus on the things that you care about, not all the garbage around it and focus on creating a good signal to noise ratio. Um, so you probably still need to collect logs, but you don't need all of it. So it's about balance. I think in general in life and especially with software development, balance is really important. And so with logging, we see uh, that one challenge is the complexity of the software and architecture themselves that are being built. But the other part is the mindsets, it's how it affected the people. They're basically traumatized. And so even when we were coming with uh, some of these new concepts, it takes people a while to kind of open up to that. It, it takes people a while to relax back and say, oh, I can get the things that I need when I need them. I don't need to uh, go all crazy around that. And so that's, um, uh, one challenge that we're seeing. Um, you asked about serverless. Uh, that's one of, uh, of the better parts that I'm proud about in our product. So it's infrastructure agnostic. We don't really care if you're running it on your local machine, if you're running it on Kubernetes, if you're running it on a legacy JVM server that you built 10 years ago, or if you're running it on the most cutting edge stuff. We've built it to be focused on the software itself. So everything around it is essentially uh, transparent to us. And um, that's actually also very important for migration. Uh, with software, also we already kind of described it. We've moved a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of way in the past decade, and we're still moving. Companies are still uh, having uh, some uh, on-prem servers and, uh, uh, my, and something in the cloud, and. Some is still um, monoliths and some is microservices. We're constantly shifting. 
And we don't even know what we'll be shifting to next, but it will come. So having a solution that works seamlessly across your infrastructure, I think is super important. That's why we're also trying to have a, a unified, uh, simplified experience. In the end of the day, all, most interactions with us, with our with Rookout would be clicking on an area or clicking on uh, indicators of things that you care about to get more information. We're trying to keep it as simple as possible so it will work across your infrastructure. And so with serverless, we were able, I think we supported, added serverless support like two months in. And, uh, and, and it's something that we're really proud of. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of uh, serverless adoption. It's usually what we're seeing for customers is that they're adding serverless on top of existing layers uh, next to Kubernetes or uh, next to their uh, existing monolith. Um, but being able to work with those in parallel, uh, I think is, is really great. And I'm really proud that we were able to pull that out. One of my favorite communities in programming these days is the Angular community. Every time I go to an Angular conference or meet up with some of my friends who are in the Angular community, I have a great time. And a lot of them have wound up on Adventures in Angular. So if you're doing front-end development, you're looking for a way to keep current on the Angular ecosystem, and you want to have a good time listening to fun people talk about great topics related to Angular, then go check out Adventures in Angular at adventuresinangular.com. So what kind of uh, insights uh, do you pull out for people regarding their serverless functions? So in the end of the day, serverless functions are just more code. Uh, sometimes they're really broken down into asynchronous small functions, and sometimes people just shove an entire module <laughs> into a serverless function. Uh, but in the end of the day, it's just code. And uh, the experience with Rookout is often code focused. So you can go into any line and literally see anything there. You can see specific variables. You see uh, this function gets those arguments and at this line, it creates a couple new arguments. So you can see the values for all of those, just like in a class of debugger, uh, but with the uh, obvious twist of not stopping because stopping asynchronous functions or anything that's running in production is the equivalent of right. uh, shooting yourself in the foot. So Rookout uses what we like to call non-breaking breakpoints. We never stop the application flow, but we give you a view that is exactly like the classic debugger from like 10, 20 years ago, where you can see all the variables and uh, all the data. Uh, additionally, you can get metadata. You can say, oh, I want to see how long it took between uh, the start of the function and this line and you can do kind of a pinpoint profiling. This is very helpful and very complementary to uh, tracing solutions or uh, APM solutions, which often will tell you things like, oh, your, uh, this uh, service is degraded in performance, or this Lambda function is now slower significantly than it used to be. Now, as a developer, you're faced with the problem of figuring out what actually changed, where the actual part is uh, that broke. And, what we're trying to bring back is the way you used to approach it in the past, which would be setting a couple of points and saying, okay, between these lines, that's how long it takes. Between these lines, this is how long it takes. And now you can do that with just a couple of clicks in production and immediately get those uh, metadata parameters of how the code's behaving. And obviously just uh, creating more data flow. You, uh, Rookout can drive data anywhere, into your logging, into your APM, into your exception management. And you can just say, okay, at this line, I want to, I want to add a new log line. I want it sent into Slack as an alert, and it will immediately happen uh, with the format and variables. If you want. I, I kind of want to jump in here a little bit. You know, I usually ask on a lot of these solutions, how would I roll my own? But it seems like a lot of this really just comes down to it's logging out to a third-party service, and it has to you know, be intelligent enough to gather the data and make it useful. And it sounds like you've solved that problem. So I would essentially have to build my own service like this in order to use it. Um, but one thing that I'm looking at is a lot of times I don't know what I need to know. I don't know what I need to be paying attention to until something breaks, right? Right. And so if I don't have that break point, for lack of a better term, you know, I don't have that instrumentation inserted into my code where I need it to get the information I need, then essentially what I wind up having to do is deploy instrumented, still broken software and then wait until I get data. Is, right. is there a better way to do that? So one of the great things with R2 is it, it's persistent. 
So those breakpoints that you set with us, they're there until you turn them off. You can tell them to turn themselves off automatically, but if you set one, it's there until, uh, until you tell it otherwise. So you can set those uh, traps in advance and then come back later and see what you caught. Uh, there, still is, there still exists this process of trying to figure out what you need and when you need it. But now what we've done is we've shortened the iteration span. Uh, iterations today for developers with auto tool like this are usually a couple of hours and sometimes even mm -hmm. longer weeks and months, depending on uh, the CI, CD quality and the organizational uh, development process. But usually it's a couple of hours going from, I want this log line in production to actually going through the pull request process and having it deployed and applied and running at the, the production side. And with this tool, instead of being a couple of hours, it's a couple of seconds because it happens immediately when you click on the button and you know nothing bad would happen, which is the other bad side of writing code, right? As a human being, you just not by purpose, by, by mistake, add, uh, errors or additional bugs or uh, other things that you didn't mean into the code and uh, break stuff that way. One thing that we're also working on now is connecting to other solutions and also adding more intelligence into the tool. That's actually part of what we're thinking with uh, what I like to uh, call Rookout 2.0. So we're, we'll be connecting to the existing services that you have, your existing logging, your existing testing, your existing um, uh, Git flow, and on top of those, use the existing workflows that you have to automatically create events where we collect data for you without you having to do anything. Um, so imagine you getting a log line, but that log line is missing uh, some key elements that you just forgot. We'll use our intelligence to automatically augment that log line so you'll have the things that you need without you having to lift a finger. And by connecting to other solutions, like the APMs that we're working with and the exception solutions that we're working with, we're really trying to create more and next generation workflows that will work for developers and not vice versa. Something I'm curious about, and I think this is a nice segue into it. Uh, we talked at the beginning of the show how it used to be you would SSH into one server to see the logs, uh, tail, F, uh, whatever. And then I nowadays we're seeing services like Rookout that allow you to you know, get it, do log tracing across an entire microservices architecture. Uh, where do you see logging going in the coming years? Uh, what oh, do you see is coming next? Wow, that's a terrific question. And also a very wide one. With uh, logging, first of all, I think that you can see that um, the market itself, the ecosystem itself is dramatically changing. Uh, logging and APM, are kind of colliding and becoming this one unified platform. I think you can see it with uh, Splunk's acquisition of signal effects. You can see it with Datadog launching their own logging solution. You can see it with Elastic and Logs.io also bringing out their own APM offerings. So this entire space that has been fragmented between logging and APM is kind of uh, becoming this unified platform. And uh, I say with probably two years, five years, we won't be really, you won't really see a difference. Uh, everything will become more structured. Performance will be uh, more integrated into how we are looking at data collection in general. Um, we'll, that will think by, as a baseline, will be a dramatic change with how we're seeing logging. The other aspect and also where I think Rookout is coming in is on data collection quality. Where we'll have to move from this logging FOMO mindset where we're trying to collect everything all the time when we're gathering a lot of data that is not useful to something that's a lot more pinpoint, a lot more focused. Because think of what's naturally happening. Software is constantly increasing in complexity. The amounts of data that we need to process are also exponentially growing. Uh, if we will try to keep recording everything, we'll just hit a bottleneck that will screech everything to a halt. And that's obviously not a good option. So um, we need to build solutions that are more intelligent, that are able to pinpoint the things that are with the focus and context that we care about. And we need to be able to mutate those quickly. Um, also, if we're kind of zooming out, think about nature. Do you know any animals or any, anything in nature that tries to remember everything all the time? That just doesn't work. 
Despite um, what the Jungle Book will make you think about elephants. Uh, <laughs> right. Never forgetting. I try to remember uh, everything. It doesn't work. Uh, uh, actually, the Jungle Book is a great example because they have this codex. They're trying to teach Mowgli. These are the things that you should focus about. These are the things that you should care about. Uh, and this, it's the same thing here. It's about teaching ourselves and teaching our different aspects of software what's important and uh, driving that focus and evolving it as our needs and our, as our software adapts. And with Rookout, we're really bringing in the most basic mechanic of being able to connect to things at the source. A lot of our data collection solutions now are really high, high up the stack. Most people don't think about it, but usually you get to collecting logs after Kubernetes has generated them. After your software has thrown it, thrown it out and it's moved to uh, FluentD and from FluentD into another ETL and aggregation solution, and only then you kind of start to make it structured and add data to that. Um, we're adding the ability to go straight to the source where the code's running in memory and put in the context, the conditions, the attention, the focus that you care about at that level. And from that point on, uh, build the right pipeline. Um, and I think that it's not only something that is um, already needed now, it will be irreplaceable and unavoidable in the next couple of years. And as logging and observability kind of become this unified platform, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, ability to drive it the right way uh, will be critical across the stack. Gotcha. So in the pre-show workup, we asked if there were some stories or examples you could call on. And you mentioned you have an interesting story about debugging from your days uh, in the uh, IDF. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, Yes, I um, what, what you're um, able to, of course, understanding yes, you may not be able to tell. I can all tell it. you everything, but then I'll have to kill you, and you're kind of spread geographically, so there will be a lot of work. So I'll try to. It's a defensive measure. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty smart. Uh, uh, distribution for disaster recovery. Yeah, well, and I'm uh, furthest east, so you get here first. So never mind. <laughs> um, so I'll try to tell the parts that I can tell. Um, so essentially, I was a young officer, uh, basically 20 years old, and I was working on a very important project that, uh, uh, was, that was being deployed into production to the field uh, within a short period of time. That project, though, had some unique characteristics. Uh, one of them is the amount of deployments that we get is limited, essentially something like uh, four times, five times, and that's it. You don't get any more. And uh, in general with the army, um, if you fail, people would die, which is, uh, it's always good to add more. Uh, this is a high stakes, pile. yeah. Yeah. Uh, I usually call this a story, uh, a story about high stacks and high stakes. So we covered the stakes and uh, let's talk about the stacks. So um, the solution itself essentially, uh, without going into the practicalities of what it did, uh, it worked on, analyzing uh, hard drives. Um, there would be a uh, file system was, would be loaded into the, into the uh, project and it will need to do some analysis. And we've in, in, after our first deployment, we encountered a really weird problem. Uh, the system would just crash in, in an area that we didn't expect at all. Um, this often happens when you're building software, uh, but you usually expect to know um, where it's crashing. You expect to like get an exception here, logs, or get some uh, indicators in like the code flow, like see what's the last thing that happened. But we saw it crashing a couple of times, and every time it kind of crashed in a very different flow of the software, and uh, and we never got any relevant log lines out of that uh, execution. So uh, we were kind of uh, in an annoying situation. Um, and what we ended up doing is trying to kind of do a uh, search around the code to kind of get uh, snapshots of uh, different things that are happening. We ended up understanding that we need to look at the file systems themselves as that are coming in because they were uh, probably the biggest variant. Um, and, but 
basically scanning an entire hard drive, saving it and send, shipping it back home is super difficult. Again, it's a matter of focusing on the things that you actually need. So we build a statistical model of pinpointing what we actually need to focus on. And uh, after an additional iteration, we we found a problem. And it was somewhere we definitely didn't expect it to be. The problem uh, ended up being a vulnerability in uh, the Windows operating system itself. Uh, by the way, that vulner vulnerability became public only something like seven years after. But essentially, uh, when you load, when you used to load a file system into Windows, as part of the FAT table, uh, there is an entry that says how many subtables exist uh, within this file system. And if you put any number that is not two into that table, you'll get a blue screen and the entire thing would crash. And the surprising part is we were thinking that we're failing because of our own code. We were looking high up the stack at what we were building and expecting it to be there, but the stack was a lot higher and a lot wider than we were expecting. And it was actually coming from the lowest parts in the software. And without being aware of all of it, and without being aware of uh, how we can shift our focus and build smart ways to collect the data that we want, we wouldn't have never been able to uh, pinpoint that. Um, but we were able to, and it was quite a successful project. And uh, I think it's not only, not only people didn't die, we actually saved lives. And uh, so that's an happy ending. Uh, and also I think a good lesson. Nice. I like that. <laughs> you know, the, the thing I think often about is the, um, you know, we start chasing down things that are really hard to, like this, this, there's this really hard problem we're trying to solve. We don't really know like where it's going to lead us, but once we get there, it's like a lot of fun and, and retrospect. It's those, it's those things that we've had to like fix that were really complicated that we remember. 10 and 20 years later <laughs> that, uh, you know, and all the little silly stuff that was maybe not as important that maybe we were excited about, like we don't remember. You know, I remember all this, all these hard things I did in, in my jobs, but uh, I don't remember how excited I was with my first Mac or whatever it was, you know, I just like those things just kind of fade away. But the things that were right. really challenging, those things are really memorable. Right. It's, I, I think, um, it's the deep challenges that kind of leave scars uh, on our skin that we remember. And it's the small things that uh, we cherish, but we never get to fully experience because things are always rushing ahead. I think that's part of the uh, modern life, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Something I think that story also highlights is, yeah, I think we talked about this a little bit, but you know, so much of software now is made uh, by stitching together uh, pre-existing libraries, pre-existing open source projects. And when you see an error, it may not be in your code. It might be in one of those libraries. And it can be very challenging to track those down. Uh, many times uh, when I'm trying to track down a problem in a Ruby program, uh, I'll just crack open the gems that it's, uh, it's dependent on on my workstation to try and trace exactly what's going on in them. Yeah, uh, I think that's also very apparent in JavaScript today. I think it, it really brings it to the edge. Now, even when just you want something that, I don't know, in front end renames a class, there's like two libraries to do that and a chain of dependencies for like every small little thing. And I think that's also like the arrow of time here is very clear. The more we move forward, the more, the, the higher the stack would become both in like the infrastructure that supports it and the components themselves. I personally uh, believe that, or kind of predict that um, what we're thinking of as SaaS today would be the equivalent of uh, modules. Essentially, uh, the more your software is growing, the more third-party dependencies you're adding in. And the, the further we go in time, the smaller and uh, conceptually less, uh, uh, dramatic those components become. Uh, we just uh, keep adding more and more. And um, I guess like five, 10 years from now, software would be like, if we look at it from two, from the perspective that we have now, we'd kind of look at it as kind of a, an abomination that's built out of multiple microservices running on multiple clouds, 
are being handled by multiple vendors. And uh, it's going to be chaotic to some degree, but it will also, I think, fuel additional growth. Um, we've already seen that come, happening, basically, the movement to uh, leveraging open source. Like if you go even five years back, uh, open source used to be a much smaller percentage of software. And now if you're including infrastructure, it's in some cases it could be like 90 and even closer to like uh, almost 100% of the solution that's being built. Um, so um, I think we'll be seeing a similar experience with uh, uh, third-party services and external services. They won't be external anymore. External will be the new internal. And uh, that will dramatically increase the complexity that we have as developers to understand how we build our software and how we debug it. So I think a lot of cool things are coming our way, but also a lot of scary things. I'm kind of, I'm excited about this, but also kind of, I'm kind of dreading it. Um, I also have the same uh, dread around the uh, quantum computing. I know it's coming and I know it will be as painful or even more painful than uh, debugging uh, microservices or asynchronous software. And so it'd probably be 10 times more painful uh, but it will also enable us to build amazing things that we probably can't even really imagine today. Mm. One ambition I had early on in my career was actually to build iOS apps. And so, of course, my solution was to start a podcast talking about how to build iOS apps. And so we asked around, we got some ideas, and eventually Josh Susser from the Ruby Rogues podcast put up the idea of the iFreaks show. And that's what we called it. You can find it at iFreakshow.com. And every week we're talking about iOS development and Swift and Objective-C and libraries and reactive programming and all of the things that go into making good iOS apps. I don't run the show anymore, but we've got Andrew Madsen who puts together the curriculum for Lambda School. We've got James Uber who's been doing iOS development as a freelancer for a long time. We've got Mike Holt, who's a good friend of mine who's worked in Xamarin and in Swift and currently does a bunch of interesting work on that. And we've got other people that we're bringing in all the time to make that show better. So if you're trying to keep up on all of the advancements that Apple makes, all of the announcements from WWDC, and you want to hear from people who are doing this day in and day out and talking about it and teaching people about it and doing the work with it, then you definitely need to check out iFreaks. You can find it at iFreaksShow.com. That's I-P-H-R-E-A-K-S show.com. Oh man, quantum computing. That's, uh, I mean... It like you know the the thing that the only thing that always sticks out with me is that they could literally like solve all our encryption algorithms like really trivially with it, and that's the only thing I ever think about with quantum computing. So that's anytime somebody brings that up, that's what the first thing that pops into my head. So any other scary things around quantum computing I haven't heard of other than in cryptography? So. Um, yeah, so I think scarier than cryptography because with cryptography there are actually already algorithms today that are uh, quantum resistant or even uh, quantum safe. Mm -hmm. um, we will need to kind of operate everything and it will be similar to uh, the revolution that happened with RSA. Um, and it will take time and a lot of things that we think are private today will end up not being private. Um, but actually, I, I'm less worried about that. I'm more worried about the uh, more fundamental implications, for example, how it will impact biology. With qu quantum computing, be, uh, the ability to anal analyze DNA and to analyze uh, specific people's DNA would become uh, much more accessible. Um, and the mutations and uh, creations that will be driven out of that, I think, are far more significant. Uh, also, the impact of the combination of AI and quantum computing will probably generate more products and more revelations in a short period of time than, uh, what, than what we're currently ex experiencing. Uh, we're like thinking, oh, it's moving fast now. It will be moving a lot, fast, a lot faster later. And th that later is not that far away. We're talking like five, 10 years. So I have a, you brought up the AI, I think. Is there... Um... Anything that you know of right now that's using AI that makes it easier for people to kind of troubleshoot or analyze logs that you think is, are really interesting that people should know about? Um, there's a couple of companies that I think are 
are trying to do more around that. I think CoreLogix are trying to push AI further for uh, data analysis. I do feel that um, the, the field in general is a bit handicapped. I think the, um, the fact that they're, they're, the main challenge is like getting quality data is kind of bit, the biggest hurdle for actually building the right AI models and training them and uh, iterating on them to uh, expert, expedite that. But I think it, we'll be seeing it coming in in the next uh, uh, couple of years. Um, another company that's worth mentioning, I think, is Anadot. They're more in the anomaly detection space than the logging space, but they can work with logging data. So I think today, if you want to leverage logs for um, identifying, uh, sorry, leverage AI over logs for identifying anomalies, identifying uh, specific situations that you need to put attention to and drive alerts out of them, I think AI there can be very helpful. But if you want AI uh, for actual debugging, for actual so discovering and understanding the problem for you, we're not quite there yet. <clears throat> I think yeah. from what I've seen. Uh, this yeah. is uh, the, la the season of Silicon Valley that just ended. Uh, this was a, a, a high pop plot point during the second half of it. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> I haven't either. No spoilers. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, right now, the most sophisticated thing we're getting in an ID is literally linting, which sometimes seems like magic to me. And then, um, and also, of course, uh, what do you call it? Oh, God. Code completion, right? Which has been around for like 20 plus years, I'm sure, right? Even longer than that, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, what's what's going to be the next big change in that? And, you know, it's just to be curious. So I, I've spent a lot of time um, working with in marketing, marketing technologies. And um, I keep waiting for somebody to, when, it, when are we going to see mass adoption of email marketing tools that are, that are sending emails based off of kind of more AI driven kind of timing and all kinds of stuff like that intent. I don't like it. I'm just, you know, I don't mean to like totally derail the topic, but it's just something that's always on my mind whenever I'm thinking about AI, because it's one of those things that can, like they can pay attention to that individual's history and, and adapt to those types of things. And, you know, I don't know, it's just interesting stuff. So. Yeah, definitely. I think the challenge there is that most AI models that we have today are kind of single iteration in the way, not in the way they're, they're built, but in the way that they work. It's like feed in a piece of data and it will, tell you where it is in the existing model. Um, and, but it's still not that good with taking another step on it and saying, okay, now do this and run it through the system again. You won't necessarily get uh, significant different uh, choices and the model itself doesn't really support moving uh, around the problem. Um, usually that part is done by uh, classic uh, programming. So I, I think that we're kind of a step before that. We're still working on getting uh, AI models to be reliant enough, and then we'll start seeing them um, adding more steps. And I think providing those AIs with capabilities to feed themselves with more data, essentially having introspection uh, would be super important. Um, and another interesting area that is kind of similar to that but is uh, adjacent is uh, observability for AI and explainability. I think one of the biggest challenges that data scientists are facing today is uh, being able to understand what the what's going on with the creation that they've that have uh, that they've brought into life. So you have an AI model; it's doing things, it, even predicting things as you want, but you don't really understand. We don't really understand fully how they do it. So when you want to take it to the next step, it, it could be very uh, challenging. And when you want to get uh, good borderlines or, or guardrails for it, you want to make sure that it doesn't do anything that uh, uh, might be uh, not compliant or not secure, uh, it's really hard to do because you don't actually understand what it's doing. So um, I think one of the other steps that are required here is adding more abilities into introspection to the AI itself, looking at how it's behaving, looking at how it's performing, and uh, adding understanding on top of that. 
I think once we have those things in line, we'll be able to take the next step and build AI that is, is more iterative. Where this is uh, taking my imagination is the movie Contact with Jodie Foster from 1997, <laughs> possibly the most influential movie on my future career when I was a kid. And I'm just trying to imagine searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, literally searching for the signal and the noise with the uh, add addition of AI observability, things to that effect. So I think, I think we'll live in exciting times, which is both a blessing and a curse. Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I, it, it's it's a great movie, and I think um, it, it all starts with like the signal that they're getting and analyzing that. Uh, also, I don't want to spoil what comes out of the signal. Uh, for, if someone haven't watched hasn't watched it yet. But, I think um, if it's 20 years past, it's okay to spoil, but <laughs> I'll leave it to your judgment, though. Um, and it's actually not that critical for the, the point that I'm trying to make. Um, I, I, think, um, I, I think part of the, what's great there is kind of that understanding that they want to understand what's coming out of it, that they want to put the energy and in, uh, investment into uh, getting what's out of the other side. And that's just the start of the journey. And I think that's kind of like what uh, we've described here. I like that a lot. Well, we are coming toward the end of the hour. Uh, anything else anyone wanted to discuss before we move on to picks? All right. Well, it's been a great, it's been great to have you on the show, or I have learned a ton and I'm looking forward to re-listening to this uh, after it's posted to really digest it more. Uh, but let's go ahead and move on to picks. Uh, we always choose one or two things that have been useful or meaningful or just, you know, have been cool in the past couple of weeks. And one that I don't think I've picked on this show before, uh, but this episode reminded me of it, is the book Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal, uh, which is, you know, one of, I'd say, the three most useful business books I've read. And what I like about it and how this relates to this episode is it really highlights the difference between a complicated system and a complex system. A complicated system is knowable. You know, it might take a while, but you can, I think he uses watchmaking as an example, but you can learn the system and you can learn it inside and out. Complicated or complex systems, that's not possible. And I think we're seeing that with our microservices architectures, our you know, spread across various clouds, et cetera. So when you have a complex system, you need to figure out different ways of getting information and interpreting that information into something meaningful than acting on that. So I highly recommend that one. My other pick, I just uh, finished my last trip of the year, my last uh, work-related trip. And I have been an Alaska Airlines frequent flyer for many years now. They get me everywhere I need to go domestically and sometimes even internationally as well. And just want to pick them. They're a great uh, airline, particularly if you're in the Pacific Northwest, because this is where their base is, but uh, nearly always a good experience with them. And they almost always get in early, which is fantastic. And with that, let's go to Scott. Ooh. All right. So I, I'm going to do a, a YouTube video. Um, I've, I've kind of gotten obsessed uh, with watching um, a lot of Malcolm Gladwell videos on YouTube. A lot of times while I'm working out and stuff like that. Um, and he, he, the video is on a sense pretty long, but I'm going to try to share a sp specific portion of it where he talks about this, um, this, this guy, Gregory Treverton discovered this thing called like, and it has to do specifically with what you're talking about now uh, about, um, in complex systems, like there's, there's this dichotomy of like a must a mystery versus a puzzle and like um, like puzzles are things that we can collect information and figure out and a mystery that we have so much information and like, we're trying to like sift through like just tons and tons of information just to find like a problem. Right. And, um, and I, I just think it's a really interesting dichotomy in it because it, we see it kind of in all aspects of, of our culture across the world now that how things have gotten so much more complex that we have to be a little more kind of flexible and free thinking. And um, I'll make that my lone pick this week. Uh, so Malcolm Gladwell, it's called the future of humanity, but I'm going to link directly to a start time once I can figure it out. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Chuck, how about you? So I'm going to throw out some board games. Um, just a couple that I've really been enjoying lately. One of them is, um, it's called Letters from Whitechapel. 
Um, I've heard a lot of people compl- or compare it to um, Scotland Yard. So if you've played that, essentially, you know, there's a, a criminal. In this case, it's Jack the Ripper. Um, and you basically, you have one person playing Jack the Ripper, and then you have five people playing the detectives. And the detectives are trying to track Jack the Ripper down um, before he gets to his hideout. And you have four round, rounds to catch him. And if you catch him, you win. And if you don't catch him, he wins. And uh, anyway, it's just this mad chase across um, London. And it, it's it's fun. It's a fun game. Um, so I'm going to pick that. Another one that I'm going to pick, and this is kind of going to expose a little bit of my uh, D&D fandom a bit, but it's it's a board game proper. It's not actually D&D, um, but it's called... Um, Lords of Waterdeep and it's a board game and you play it like a board game, but uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and you wind up, it's kind of an economics game. So you have one resource, which is adventurers, but I mean, you just, you spend them to finish quests and then you have, um, you've got gold, right? So you can buy resources, you can build buildings. And then if uh, somebody else uses your building, then you get a resource in return Whoever has the most victory points wins. It's it's pretty fun. We have it and we have the expansion for it. And and it's just a ton of fun. So um I'm gonna go ahead and pick those. Awesome. And over to you, Or. Um, I've recently been really enjoying the works by uh Sam Harris, uh specifically one of his uh title books, uh, Waking Up. Uh he essentially deals a lot with mindfulness and uh, introspection and meditation in a non-religious way in a very, he, his background is kind of as a newer scientist. And uh, as a software engineer, I kind of realized through that book that the human mind is essentially a microservice-based architecture. Um, and I've started to notice this uh, around my life. For example, me walking into a room, not remembering what I wanted to do, but already opening the cabinet and oh, rem- remembering, oh, I actually wanted to fetch something over there. So there's like another service in me that ran through and did that. Um, there's a, also a very uh, strong point that uh, he gives in the book that uh, uh, describes split brain experiments uh, where he's showing um, people that due to epilepsy and surgery that split their brains. And one uh, one of the participants in that study uh, retained speech in both uh, both his, 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 um, his lobes, even though that they're separated. And when they were separately presented by get, showing a question to uh, each eye separately the, uh, with a question of what do you want to be when uh, you continue with your life, each side of his brain responded with a different answer. And so I think that that really drove me to understand that our what we perceive as a, an individual as ourselves is actually built a lot of different components that are running asynchronously, sharing data with one another. And we ourselves are kind of an emergent phenomena, just like what we're running on Kubernetes. And um, also, just one more side note on that, uh, essentially meditation and debugging, same thing. And I like just, that very much. Uh, I'm actually planning to write a lot on that. So uh, maybe you have something to look forward to. Uh, one last thing, just completely different. I'm really enjoying uh, the fictional works by Alistair Reynolds. He's a physicist and astronomer turned science fiction writer. And what I like about him is that he breaks a lot of the classic concepts. Uh, he, for example, touches on time travel, but uh, avoids all the usual tropes. I won't spoil the book, but one of his recent shorter stories, Permafrost, uh, is really great. It gives you a new way of thinking about stuff. And I think that's something that we always need to be looking for, for uh, new ways of thinking about the, what we have around ourselves to get to better stuff. Awesome. I think, nice. oh, go ahead. I think that about does it for this episode of Adventures in DevOps. Uh, thank you again so much for being with us, Or. I learned pleasure. a lot. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we're, when by the time this comes out, it's 
probably getting very near to the holidays, uh, if not already past it. So I hope you have a happy holidays or had a happy holidays. And we will see you all next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.